Good morning, everybody. Happy Palm Sunday. Our service is about to start in less than two minutes, so we invite you to come on in and find your place. Find a seat. We're having technical difficulties, so come on in and we'll fix them. We'll see you in a minute. What is that? That's a tip, usual one. Check, check, check. It's coming through on two. Yeah, it, it's the because the res, the transmitter so is right here, like next to the antenna. Oh. It's bleeding over onto the other channels. So maybe it just because it was not connected well and he's standing too Well, I don't know. I, I've, I've given this a lot of work. Check, check. Yeah. Okay. I don't get away from the board. Good morning, Coeur d'Alene Bible Church. How are you guys? Good. I hear some goods out there. Yeah. You get excited about snow today? Yeah. <laughs> a little different from last Sunday. What a, what a tale of two different Sundays. Uh, but it is uh, sort of spring around here, and this is what happens. Uh, it always seems to me like when Easter comes around, you got to get another snow before Easter, whether it's actually uh, the day you're supposed to hunt the Easter eggs or somewhere around that. So I guess this is just, it's just fitting. So welcome. Welcome to, uh, to our service today. Uh, for all of you guys who are uh, part of our family and for anybody who's new or newer or visiting, we just want to give you a, a hearty warm welcome. Uh, and we're glad you're here to be with us today. We have a lot to share with you. Um, not only just to get into God's Word, but this is Holy Week. Today's beginning of Holy Week. It's Palm Sunday. So it's a, it's, it's a great week. I always look forward to this from the, the, the calendar, just because I think it's a great time to stop and reflect upon uh, Christ and His life and what He's done for us. And then, of course, celebrating Easter uh, next Sunday. Um, it's full of emotions, as it should be. Um, so look forward to that. So I do have some announcements to share with you. Um, first one is Women of Valor Luncheon Today in the Gathering Room. So this is for our widows and our older single women. No RSVP needed. Just show up and enjoy a wonderful home-cooked meal. And I do know those people who cook those meals just do it with a lot of love, and uh, um, they're wonderful meals when I hear about them. So you guys enjoy today. Uh, just show up in the Gathering Room after uh, church. All right, and then next week, next Wednesday... On April 3rd, Emotionally Healthy Relationships is uh, seminars beginning. Who's all signed up for that? All right, we got some hands out there. I know there's been a fair, a fair number of people signed up for it. It's a exciting, challenging, but very important uh, seminar to work on relationship, relationship building, breaking down barriers. Uh, and even this, uh, a lot of the other Emotionally Healthy books have been good about helping us to um, improve those things, Lord. And we're, we're challenged by them. So we just have to admit that we're challenged by them, and this is a very good tool that we're excited about. Excited about doing this as a church family, because as a family, guess what? Sometimes we have trouble with relationships. Uh, as a church family, within our own families, and uh, this is a tool that can help us dramatically. So sign up today if you are going to be part of it and you have not signed up. It's in the lobby. The, the sign-up is to ensure that we have enough materials for everyone uh, coming. So... Once again, it starts on April 3rd. All right, 
I do have an announcement. Um, how many of you guys were at the youth uh, chili soup cook-off and pie auction? Oh yeah, that, exactly. There was a lot of you there. Yeah, anyone want to guess how much money was raised for youth for their mission trip? $7,500, that was very close, but it was actually more. Yeah. About $1,000 more. $8,500 was raised, so yes. It was a lot of fun. The soup and chili were awesome. The, the youth did a great job with their aprons and team names. Uh, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. It was a great time as a family to be together, and the generosity of you guys it just pours out love on, that, and on the youth, and they just can recognize that we're behind them, we're supporting them, we love them, uh, and encouraging them. And so thanks for coming out and being part of that. It was, it was awesome to be part of. So, All right, and since we like to eat together as a church, um, I'm always fond of that, so hope you guys are too. Next Sunday, which is Easter, we have a potluck fellowship breakfast that begins at 9.30. So don't have to worry about um, doing breakfast at home. We're going to eat together for a meal. We do ask that you bring a breakfasty dish to share, such as eggs, breakfast meat, fruit, pastry, uh, something like that's kind of the idea. The uh, elders are also kind of trying to get together some guys to do some other cooking, and they will um, be providing some uh, food as well. So come hungry for church next week, but at 9.30 so we can eat together and then um, worship afterwards. All right. There's more information in your bulletin. It's actually chock full of information. It is a busy week. It's a busy time. It's a church. So please look for that for the other details uh, for the remainder of this week. All right. If you guys would stand with me, please. We do want to pray as we get started with our service. So if you feel comfortable, hold out your hands just in a posture of just opening our hearts to the Lord. So Heavenly Father, Lord, we do come before you to acknowledge you as our Savior, as our God, Lord. As we enter into Holy Week, this is Palm Sunday. Uh, Lord, even though it's snow here, um, obviously it, it seems weird, but it, uh, we reflect back upon history and that day that you triumphantly entered into Jerusalem, Lord. We just think about what that mission, uh, your, your mission had been leading into that week, uh, Lord, about um, your time here on earth and you're teaching us and you're giving us um, your your words, Lord, but also these stories that we think about and healings um, and uh, just the love you poured out upon the people. But Lord, this is a tragic week as well as we think about the death um, that you had to take upon the cross for us, Lord. Uh, and that's heavy, uh, Lord, because it was our sins that caused that. And you had to take our place uh, for us, Lord, and we are so thankful for that, Lord. And then the emotions, once again, are, is, is full of joy and rejoicing as you rose uh, from the dead. And um, uh, you conquered death, Lord, and you conquered our sin nature. And we are so thankful. So, Lord, as we just begin this week and we begin with worship, let our hearts just be full of love and adoration to you, our Father, our Holy Father, that has uh, saved us from ourselves. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In the first day of Holy Week, Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry of Jesus. And so we're going to sing praises um, like, like many people did on that first Palm Sunday, um, even if they didn't quite know what they were getting into. Um, but we're excited to praise Jesus this morning and to celebrate uh, his, his first public, big public announcement as the King of all creation. And that's beautiful. Amen, church? So can we sing and, and praise God this morning for that? Amen. to you. 
strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. When we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. scripture with me this morning. O Zion, messenger of good news, shout from the mountaintops. Shout it louder, O Jerusalem. Shout and do not be afraid. Tell the towns of Judah, your God is coming. Yes, the sovereign Lord is coming in power. He will rule with a powerful arm See, he brings his reward with him as he comes. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will carry the lambs in his arms, holding them close to his heart. He will gently lead the mother sheep with their young. Amen. This is our king. This is the one we worship. Let's continue in that this morning.
church to close. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve glory. today brought a passage of scripture to mind that, that I want to share with you here as we, as we pause and, and uh, prepare our hearts for a moment of prayer. Um, Paul, in the letter to Colossians, writes to the Colossian church, may you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father. He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. For he has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. And that's a beautiful thing that we are um, bearing in mind and observing uh, this holy week. As beautiful as that is that we celebrate being transferred to this kingdom of light we also know that when we look at the world around us, there are those who are still trapped and lost in the domains of darkness that still exist throughout the world. And one of those things that has been particularly um, and tragically in the news recently has been a, a growing humanitarian crisis in the country of Haiti. And maybe you've seen this in the news, but um, gang violence has uh, basically become a civil war with, with thousands of people being killed. 
uh, tens of thousands of people being displaced, um, all kinds of unspeakable atrocities happening in the streets of their, uh, of their capital city, mainly Port-au-Prince. Um, the evil powers are having their way, stirring up conflict in that place. And so after the service today, we are actually going to have um, a brief time of prayer in the prayer room specifically to that situation. We want to cry out and ask Jesus to be merciful and to move in that situation. So um, if you have a few minutes after the service, we really encourage you to come and um, just spend some time with your brothers and sisters in prayer. We'll have a few uh, prayer sheets uh, to prompt you along the lines of how to pray for that. So if you have a few minutes to spare, I really invite you all to come to the prayer room. If, if we get packed out of the room and we have to spill out of the room, that's awesome. Don't worry about it being too full. So let's do this. Let's, let's bow our hearts and our heads and um, just pause in a moment of prayer as we move towards the message that Pastor Kurt has for us today. So will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we do celebrate that you have transferred us to your kingdom of light and life. You've rescued us, Jesus. You heard the cry of your people. You heard the cry of all mankind, anguishing in darkness and sin. And Jesus, there are many more of our fellow humans that are anguishing in the darkness of sin and violence and injustice. And Jesus, we ask you to be gracious and merciful. And Lord, as we come into Pastor Kurt's message today, we pray that you will stir our hearts to hear your voice as we think about your entry into Jerusalem, as we think about your work during the Holy Week. Jesus, stir us up to see things the way you see them. Give us ears to hear you this morning, Jesus. We love you and ask for this in your name. Amen. All right, we're going to go ahead and release the kids. And as the kids are released, take a moment to stand up, greet each other, say good morning. Maybe find someone you don't know and introduce yourself. All right, well, let's regather, and as you do, if you take your Bible, you can turn to Mark chapter 11. That's where we're going to be today, is Mark chapter 11 in our study of Scripture. Uh, before we get there, though, uh, we have so many announcements this week that Dwayne and I actually had to split them, or he would have been up here forever, just and you lost track, but there's a few more things related to this week to Holy Week that we want to get on your calendar. So Dwayne talked about the breakfast gathering before the Easter service. Uh, as far as this week, uh, the next thing we have in our calendar is what we call a Maundy Thursday communion service. Uh, and that may sound strange to you. Um, some of us think it sounds like Monday, Thursday, and like get your day straight. Uh, but anyone here know what the word Maundy refers to? Look at that, we're all going, what in the world are we talking about? What kind of service is this? Well, the word Monday comes from, it's kind of, a, uh, the word we would draw from it is mandate or commandment. And if you recall, in the upper room, Jesus gave his disciples a new commandment. And what was that to do? Yeah, to love. To love. That would be the mark of discipleship. And so that's what it is. It's just a celebration, a communion service where we're actually trying to to a degree, put ourselves in the place of the upper room. So we're going to be in the, interesting, we're going to be in the lower room, the youth lounge, but we're just going to set it up in, in a bit of a family setting uh, to just share together in some scriptures, some songs, 
and communion. It's, it's in some ways very simple, but I think it's, it could be very beautiful as well. Uh, there'll be child care for up to five years old, and so uh, uh, we believe the kids older than that can participate and, and at least to some degree uh, take part in what's going on. So that's this Thursday at 6.30 in the Youth Lounge. So if you're thinking about Holy Week, be a great way just to put your heart and mind on all that Jesus went through. Uh, that's Monday Thursday service. As far as our Easter service goes, we have two services uh, during the year where we, we say it's everyone, all family together, and that's Christmas Eve service and Easter service. For one, it gives our nursery workers who work all year long a break. It allows them to be a part of what's going on with us. And as the way we've designed the service, it's meant to be very fast-moving and kid-friendly. We know that you've got your kids with you, so it'll just move very quickly from element to element. Um, and with that in mind, inside your bulletin, you'll find a sheet that looks like this. It says, Celebrate Easter. Uh, and this is your guide for Holy Week, just to be reminded maybe of dates and times and things like that. Um, and we encourage you to pass this sheet on maybe to a friend or a neighbor and just an invitation to say, hey, we'd love you to come join us for uh, any of our Easter gatherings. Come take part as well. And if you're a person who loves to invite people, we actually have some extra copies. In fact, they're on a, a more of a hard, cardstock paper, a little you know, more sturdy, at the back tables right here uh, through the main ent exit entrance of the auditorium. And so, uh, yeah, if you want to invite people, grab some of those, take them to your neighbors, your coworkers, your friends, people you go to school with, whatever, and uh, share with them what's going on. Hopefully we've covered that ground, a lot of announcements, a lot of things going on. So, as I said, if you haven't already, turn in your Bible to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. And we'll get started here. Let's start off with a word of prayer. Father, I pray that you will guide us through the scriptures today and encourage us as we think about Palm Sunday, what it means, what's the importance to us. And God, we always, we always want to take away something with us, something you want us to know or something you want us to do. And so I pray the very same thing for us today. And so, God, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we started this series in Mark's Gospel back in January 2023. And as I was working on the preaching schedule for the spring, for this time of year, 2024, I was kind of, I was seeing that it was heading towards, you know, uh, Holy Week and things like that. And I thought, how are we going to fit in regard to Palm Sunday, and you won't believe it, it amazed me, the passage today is Jesus entering into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. It just worked out that way. I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, so what is the significance of Palm Sunday? Why, why do we bring attention to this date? Uh, is it all about palm branches? You know, I'll just celebrate the palms being waved. Uh, I would say it's much more, much more to Palm Sunday. In fact, I would say that Palm Sunday is about how Jesus' ministry went from being somewhat open yet secret to becoming fully public. This is really when Jesus steps out on the stage of his public, truly public ministry. Palm Sunday has Jesus leaving behind his earthly ministry and taking the very first steps into his eternal ministry, that ministry of redeeming souls and transforming lives. When we last left Jesus last week in Mark chapter 10, he and his disciples had just passed through Jericho, and they were now walking up the road that leads to Jerusalem. When I say walking up the road, it was a bit of a climb. Jericho, it's one of the lowest cities in the world, sits at 800 feet below sea level. Jerusalem, 20 miles to the west, is perched at about 2,500 feet above sea level. So truly a climb up to Jerusalem. We also learned last week that Jesus' entourage added a new person, that person being Bartimaeus, who Jesus had just healed from blindness. Remember, Jesus said to him afterwards, you, you are free to go, and Bartimaeus said, no, I'm going to stay with you, and began to follow him. 
So let's pick up the story as it's recorded for us in Mark chapter 11. It says this, As Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the towns of Bethphage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into that village over there, he told them. As soon as you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone, anyone asks what you are doing, just say, the Lord needs it and will return it soon. The two disciples left and found the colt standing in the street, tied outside the front door. As they were untying it, some bystanders demanded, what are you doing untying that colt? And they said what Jesus had told them to say, and they were permitted to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw it, threw their garments over it, and he sat on it. So, prior to this day, what was Jesus' primary mode of transportation? Walking, yeah, his feet. Just walked from place to place. Jesus walked everywhere. In fact, uh, some have dubbed Jesus with a nickname. It comes from the Greek. He's the peripatetic preacher. Look that up. That just means the one who walks around from place to place. But on this day, Jesus would be entering Jerusalem not as an itinerant rabbi, but as Israel's Messiah King. This is Jesus' grand entrance, a royal entrance, we might say. At the very same time this is happening, Jerusalem is being flooded with Passover pilgrims, people coming to celebrate God's great salvation from, his, uh, from Pharaoh. You remember where Pharaoh enslaved and exploited the Jewish people some 1,500 years prior. They're celebrating their freedom, or God rescued them. And of course, it would make sense that some people would be talking about the fact that God had promised another Savior, the Messiah, who would rescue Israel as well. Now, when we think about this passage, uh, and we think about most earthly kings, if they're going to make an entrance into the city, we tend to think that they make it with a lot of, you know, panache or bravado. Here comes the king. Uh, we would think that they would ride a powerful steed. Uh, kings got a king, right? They just got to do what they do. Uh, we think that a king would come with his own entourage or an army just to show his power, and that's the idea, making entrance that communicates authority, power, and dominion. When I think about our current culture, when you think about a world leader coming to another country, you know, they drive into town in a limousine with a security detail. They've just flown in on a private jet. There's just that sense of, of power. I think it would be pretty disconcerting if a world leader rode into town on a unicycle. We would just go, that's weird, you know. Yet Jesus does not ride into Jerusalem on a mighty, muscular horse. No, Jesus enters Jerusalem on a young colt of a donkey. And this image is very purposeful. Because rather than coming in saying, look at my strength and my might, uh, this entering into the city on a colt of a donkey is meant to produce an image that Jesus is a king who is all about humility and peace. He's all about grace and gentleness which was very different with what a lot of people had in mind about their Messiah. But, you know, we see throughout Mark's gospel, in fact, all of the gospels, that Jesus is presented not as this type of king, domineering, powerful, authoritarian. Remember in John chapter 10, Jesus described himself as someone not to be served, but to serve humanity by giving his life as a ransom for lost sinners. This is the type of king Jesus is. Now, what's really cool about all of this as we get into this story is when it comes to the, the Old Testament prophecies regarding the arrival of the Messiah, they fit right in with what's happening. The primary text that people go to is 
Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, where it says this, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. Wow. So the Old Testament talked about this. Uh, the, all four Gospels focus in on this riding in on a colt, so we know it's, it's very important. So what we have happening here is that the most excellent, the most perfect king is stepping onto the public stage for the most important week in human history. I like how Tim Keller uh, wrote about how this perfect king entered into the city. He wrote this, In Jesus we find a king of infinite majesty, yet complete humility, perfect justice, yet boundless grace, absolute sovereignty, yet submission, all sufficiency in himself, yet entire trust and dependence on God. So you think in the course of human history, there have been some bad kings, right? And there have been a lot of good kings. But now, on the outskirts of Jerusalem, the world is about to be introduced to the perfect king. So what's the response? We look at verse 8. Many in the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others spread leafy branches they had cut in their fields. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God! Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Praise God in highest heaven. Highest heaven. So, judging on what I just read, would you say that the reception to Jesus was negative or positive? Yeah, it looks pretty positive, right? They're not booing him, but they're, they're cheering out for him. Uh, this is because the people knew their scriptures. They knew their Old Testament prophecies. They knew that Zechariah 9.9 talked about Israel Messiah riding on a colt into Jerusalem. They knew scriptures like Genesis 49 or Numbers 2 or 2 Kings 9 that all have connections to the Messiah's entrance into Jerusalem. So they've got this all in their minds. They're saying, this is happening and so the result is we get this amazing scene, this amazing picture of a pathway of coats and palm branches laid out to honor the man the people perceive to be the long-awaited Messiah. They say, this is happening. Verse 10 tells us what they were shouting as, they, uh, as Jesus rode by. The New Living Translation uses the word praise. It's a decent rendering, but the literal word in Hebrew is the word Hosanna, we sang that in the very first song we sang today. And this word literally means, please save us. It is a form of praise. It's saying, you're the one who can do this. But it's a cry. It's a cry to be rescued. And this would be the role of the Messiah, to be a rescuer, to be a savior. Now, these calls to... Uh, be saved. These cries of, the, of Hosanna were, were not random. They were just saying out of the blue. They were drawn directly from Scripture, specifically Psalm 118. Now, what's interesting about Psalm 118 is that it's also telling us that God's anointed would be rejected. It's a great uh, Holy Week read. I encourage you to go, to, to go to Psalm 118 and spend some time there. But here's something we've got to reckon with when we work through the Palm Sunday story. The people who were waving the palm branches, throwing down their coats and shouting Hosanna, were on track regarding God's plan to provide a Savior. Yet, as we've seen so often in Mark's Gospel, the perspective of many in Israel was that the Messiah would be this political, military leader whose primary purpose was to come and free Israel from their Roman occupation. So this, by force and by might, the Messiah would kick them to the side. So the cry, save us, 
it wasn't so much a cry for spiritual rescue that was personal, you know, to the person, but rather it was a national rescue they were seeking, a rescue from their sworn enemies. Jason Meyer commented, he wrote this, the people were crying out for Jesus to save them, but they misunderstood salvation. They believed that salvation meant the Messiah would come and destroy the people oppressing them, resulting in their liberation. I love this next paragraph. He gets it so right. He writes, They expected Jesus to judge the nations and save them. They never would have expected that he would judge them and save the nations. What is missing in this story is a repentant people who realize that the problem is not the Romans, but with themselves. Each person in the crowd should have cried out, I need a Savior for my sins. But they did not. For me, all of this underscores the absolute importance of number one, knowing who Jesus is, and number two, Jesus' ultimate purpose for coming to the earth. It's so important to know this. See, if you go out on the street, maybe in your workplace, at school, talk to family members who don't know Jesus and ask them, well, who is Jesus? You will get all sorts of responses. Now, some people don't like Jesus at all. You know, they'll push back against him. But some people will look and say, well, well, Jesus is a good teacher. He had some good life lessons, you know, things like do unto others as you would, you know, those kind of things. Uh, some people see Jesus kind of as a dashboard Jesus, a good luck charm. You know, you cry out to Jesus when things are going bad, but otherwise you, you don't really think about him a whole lot. But Jesus' ultimate purpose was this. And it's, it was this and it is this. To come from heaven to spiritually redeem and restore lost and hopeless sinners who cannot save themselves. That's Jesus' purpose. Remember, Jesus himself said in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. You get Jesus' mission statement right there. So here's something really important to think about. If a person doesn't think that they are lost or need saving, well, there's not really much Jesus can do for them. There's a disconnect. So if a person thinks that, you know, uh, they can move forward spiritually without God's help. The truth is they will stay stuck in their brokenness and their separation from God. So when we think about how many people misunderstood Jesus' purpose, I mean, there were even some people who were laying down those palms and throwing down their coats. They were saying, Hosanna. Well, some of those people six days later would be saying, crucify him. Kind of a shocking thought to think about. One thing I think about when I read through this passage is how courageous and determined Jesus had to be to just keep going, to get on that donkey and begin that journey that would lead to the cross just six days later. I mean, Jesus could have said, well, I'll find kind of a side entrance in Jerusalem. You know, let's avoid all the attention and the fanfare you recall that the religious leaders were trying to find Jesus because they wanted to destroy him. In reflecting upon Jesus' very public entrance into Jerusalem, William Barclay wrote this, One of the most dangerous things a person can do is to go to a people and tell them that all their accepted ideas are wrong. Any person who dares to tear up the roots of a people's nationalistic dreams is in for trouble. And that was Jesus, right? He kept speaking the truth to those religious leaders, to Israel. And this is why the religious establishment was so put out with Jesus. They just wanted to eliminate him. Yet, in this final holy week, Jesus will fully and boldly commit himself to the mission of making spiritual redemption a possibility for anyone who places their faith in him. And I'm always struck by this. The great motivating factor for God to do this 
I mean, why? Sometimes we wonder, why would God do this? Well, the scripture tells us it's because God loves us. God's great love. To restore broken creation, to redeem creation, and to bring us back into relationship with him. And Palm Sunday is how everything gets started. And this journey to the cross and to the tomb and the resurrection is what we're going to be looking at from this point all the way through September. We're going to take our time taking each step along this way. So how do we apply this? What do we do with this passage? Well, I think there was a question I thought with the, with the, the idea in mind that so many people got Jesus wrong, they really didn't understand his mission. I thought I'd put a question before us to grapple the, with. And the, the question is this. What's our view of Jesus? What's our view of Jesus? Do we see Jesus properly? So a few questions maybe to filter through and help us evaluate. So number one, do we understand Jesus to be the one who paid the price for our sins so that we might be relationally reconnected to God? Do we view Jesus as the sole source of life and hope in a world that is full of death and despair? Do we believe that Jesus is able to take our life and transform it from the inside out, just as the Apostle Paul described as becoming new creations, truly changing us from who we are more into the image of Christ? Do we recognize that on our own, any attempts to spiritually restore ourselves, independent from God's intervention, will always fall short because redemption only occurs because God graciously makes it happen? And here's the big question. Have you trusted Jesus to be the Savior of your soul and the King of your life rather than just a good luck charm or describing him as a good teacher or some kind of religious icon? Those are big questions, but those are vitally important questions. So, Palm Sunday launches Jesus toward the ultimate sacrifice of his life on the cross, where through we find healing, we find rescue we find redemption. And we might say that the central message of Palm Sunday is this, is that God sees us and he loves what he sees and he seeks to rescue us through Jesus. And the only requirement on us is that we welcome him, we invite him in, we we receive his peace, we receive his salvation and we exercise faith in his ultimate healing. That's the proper response to all that Jesus is going to do when we think about Holy Week. Father, I pray that you will encourage us today as we spend time here reflecting and worshiping, praising, thinking about who you are and why you came, your purpose. So God, I just pray as we celebrate Palm Sunday, I'm grateful that we have the ability to to have the scriptures to tell the whole story, that we might understand the true meaning and mission of the Messiah. So God, just speak to our hearts today. And maybe it is, maybe our application is just to be full of gratitude and worship just amazed at your grace and your glory. God, speak to our hearts today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Kurt. Uh, A few thoughts from Paul's letter to the Ephesians that I just thought really um, go along with your message today. Paul says, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. 
God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. For our response and reflection time today, man, if you know the Lord, if you uh, belong to the Father's dear Son and you are found in him, then today is a great day to rejoice in that, uh, to cry out in praise to the King. And I think we are going to do that here in a few minutes through the musical worship as well. And if you don't know the Lord today, today is a great day to come to him, to have your sins forgiven, to have your freedom purchased. It gives the Father great pleasure to bring you into his family and to lavish his kindness and his grace on you. So let's come to the table today and receive whatever the Lord has for each one of you. His, the bread reminds us of his broken body and the juice reminds us of his blood that was shed. And these things together bring us life. He shares his life so that we can have life in him. So the tables will be open in a few moments as the music begins, and you can come down and receive uh, the elements from the table, take them back to your seat, and take them as the time seems right to you. Have a conversation with the Lord, and, and talk with him about whatever you need to talk with him about today. Uh, there will also be a few people down front here. If you would like to have someone pray with you or for you, you come down and you can come down and receive prayer. And I'll also carry the communion tray around. And so if you would like me to bring you the elements wherever you are seated out there, just wave at me, flag me down. And uh, I will be happy to bring you those elements. Let's do this. Let's have a, a moment of prayer as we go into this time of reflection and response to the Lord. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, you had a clear vision that day that you got on the donkey's back and rode into Jerusalem. You had a clear vision of what you were going to do in the days to come. And you were wholly devoted to that mission because it gave the Father great pleasure to rescue many sons and daughters. Jesus, I pray as we come to the table today and take the elements, Lord, that you will stir our hearts to the things that you have for each one of us. Lord, today for some of us, that may be just a spirit of celebration and praise, crying out in thankfulness and gratitude for your goodness. Lord, for some of us, it may be a spirit of humility and repentance, perhaps for sins that are in our life, or perhaps we've, we've strayed from your path in some way. And Lord, perhaps for some, it's, it's coming to you for the first time, coming to you to receive forgiveness and redemption and restoration. Jesus, guide our hearts today to respond to you the way that we need to, the way that is good and fitting for the message that we've heard today. We love you and we trust you with this time. Amen.
Just take a moment in your own heart to praise him. Take a moment in your own heart to thank him for coming as king and as savior, just quietly in your own heart. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. We're going to go out singing one more song about your kingdom, about your rule, and how you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. All heaven, all earth is yours, God. Amen. reading that scripture, uh, 
it came to my mind just the idea that when we think about that relationship with Jesus entering into it, for someone who maybe doesn't know Jesus, maybe they're a visitor here for the very first time and they're just kind of wondering, oh, well, is this auditorium filled with people who just were born Christians? And there's no such thing. We're born into death. We're born into sin. And we must be reborn in Jesus. And uh, so no one's born a Christian. Or, you know, if you grew up in a Christian family, does that make you a Christian? Nope. We've all got to make that decision. We've all got to trust in Jesus on our own to make that step. But I want to give you an encouragement in that as well. Uh, some of us might say, well, you know, I'm too old to become a Christian. You know, it's too late for me. That's, that's a lie. That's false. The other thing will be to just say, well, I look at my life. I've made so many mistakes. God wouldn't have me. And we're not saved by what we do. We're saved by putting our trust in Christ and having us redeem us and restore us. So the invitation is open. We've got to step through and admit our, our fallenness, our sinness. Uh, we need to communicate our need for a Savior. And so I just want to make sure we understand that as we walk through this Holy Week together. With that in mind, let's go to prayer. Father, thanks for bringing us together today. Thanks for this gathering where we can worship you. We're blessed because we can sing songs like we're victorious in Jesus because we know what happened. We, knew, we know about the cross, but we also know about the, the open tomb, the empty tomb. And so, God, we are just grateful and thankful. So we give you praise today. God, work in our hearts. Bring us to worship you more and more. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Quick reminders, if you want to be part of that prayer for what's going on in Haiti, that'll take place in the prayer room. Emotionally healthy relationships, sign up today because we need to get all our materials together this week. So thanks so much for joining us. Have a great week, you guys, walking with Jesus.